It's hard to talk, or it's hard to say anything after the movie. Welcome, good evening from Budapest. Uh, I hope you all stay tuned in. And we have here the director of the movie, Jonathan Jakubowicz. Jonathan, please come on stage. Welcome. Hi, thank you. So we have, Jonathan, more than 600 people uh, saw the screening. And let me just tell them uh, a little bit about you. And you correct me if I say something that is, is not correct, or the, actually the internet wasn't correct about you, okay? Okay. So let's just tell you that Jonathan Jakubowicz, winner of the German Film Peace Prize in 2020, for his film Resistance, you just saw, is Venezuela's most celebrated filmmaker and writer. His film, Sequestro Express, was nominated for Best Foreign Language Film at the British Independent Film Award and was a New York, New York Times critic's pick in 2005. His family, as we all are, comes from Poland, or not all, but a little bit. Sequestro Express became the nation's biggest box, of, box office hit of all time, which enraged then uh, President Hugo Chavez, whose government opened two trials against Jakubowicz, who was forced to leave Venezuela, and now he lives in Los Angeles. This is where he's uh, tuned in. His latest film, Resistance, what you just saw, star, stars Academy Award-nominated actor Jesse Eisenberg and Ed Harris, and also Hungarian actors like Vitsa Kerekes and Geza Röri. Special thanks for that. <laughs> and it was released in the United States of 27th of March this year during the coronavirus epidemic. And it became the number one theatrical movie in America for two weeks in a row. Most multiplexes were closed and only a few independent and drive-in theaters remained open, which gave Resistance the most unusual top box office spot of all time. In November 2016, Jakubowicz published his first novel, well, I'll try to say it correctly, Las Aventuras de Juan Planchard. <laughs> Very good. Good, thank you. About that Hungarian accent. <laughs> and it immediately became the bestseller in the Spanish language market. In February 2017, it became the number one Amazon bestseller for all foreign language fiction. In Venezuela, the book sparked unprecedented success, not only in the record-breaking breaking sales, but also in the amount of public gatherings to read it. One community of 50,000 people that define themselves as resistance to the Maduro dictatorship read the book aloud every night on the encrypted frequency of the application Zillo. The book is on its way to become the biggest bestseller of all time for a Venezuelan author. And it is being adopted to the stage by the legendary playwright Moises Kaufman. So, welcome. Shalom. Shalom. You are Stead Kivan of Jonathan. Hi. Hi, thank you. Thank you for, for inviting me and thanks to everyone who's watching us and who saw the film. This is very unusual and very exciting to have a screen that it's so international at the same time. Okay, so I have a few questions. We're going to talk a little bit about the movie and why we're talking uh, all you, uh, dear audience, can uh, write your uh, questions if you have uh, on a, in a chat room. I'm uh, watching it all the time. So if you have any question, we will have uh, time for a Q&A. OK, first, a question that maybe uh, some of us would think that it's not connected. But I ask anyone who I uh, spoke with in the last few months, how are you? How are you doing these pandemic months? I'm OK. I mean, it's been you know, strange and difficult. I think it's easier for a writer to be in a pandemic than it is for most everyone else, because in a weird way, we are always in quarantine, you know, sitting down in our office, just writing. And, you know, when I'm not directing, that's what I do. So my life hasn't completely changed like it has for most people. But um, but it's been difficult, you know. And we're I'm in California where we have a ton of cases, and you know, there's lockdown, no lockdown. You know, it's it's been a process of adapting to this insanity. But you know, hopefully things will get better soon. Could you do any filming job, or it, it's only writing these days? Yeah, I mean, happily, I 
I just finished Resistance and was releasing it when this whole thing started. So usually after I film, I write. So I was going to write this year all the way through. There weren't any plans of filming anything. So I didn't film anything. I didn't, you know, lose any production because of this. Um, and there is some filming right now. My production designer is doing a, a TV series. He's been doing it for, for the last few weeks or months, perhaps. And so there is some filming that's going uh, happening again. You know, who knows if that's going to stop, if their cases go up again. But uh, it's, it's slowly, re you know, the, the industry is slowly coming back to life. All right. So uh, as you told, you as I also told that you also wrote this movie and directed the movie. Uh, where the story is coming from? Are you, did, you, did you hear about uh, Marcel Marceau or did you read or someone told you? Or I mean, as for me as a, as a Hungarian, it's strange that a Venezuelan uh, Jewish guy knows before me about Marcel Marceau being a war hero and, and a Jew, same time. <laughs> well, the... The interesting thing is that it's not only for you, even for French people, you know, it was a surprise, you know, when, um, you know, I'm the son of Holocaust, the grandson of Holocaust survivors on both sides of my family. And, you know, I, it was always very close to me. We were also very emotional. So I never really thought I could make a Holocaust film because of that. Um, but then I read that Marceau was Jewish, that Marceau saved children in the war, and he immediately got me intrigued. So I started doing research. And at the time, my prior film, Hands of Stone, was going to premiere at the Cannes Film Festival. So I thought, since I'm going to France, maybe I can do some research over there. And I was able to track down George Loinger, who's Marcel's first cousin and was the head of the Jewish Boy Scouts of France during the war. Is the guy who invites Marcel at the beginning of the movie. He enters the butcher shop and tells him, come help us. And he was 106 years old living in Paris when I met him. And, and we sat together for, for a couple of hours and he told me a lot of the stories that you see in the film. And after that, I felt there was really nothing I could do with my life before I told this story. And, and that's what I did. You know, it, it felt like, it felt like I could do it also because it wasn't a story about extermination. It was a story about salvation. And, and that made me feel comfortable that I, I could do it without, you know, completely melting in tears on set, you know, which I did anyway, but it's, uh, it, it felt possible and such a unique story and such a forgotten story. And, and Marcel is never really, seen as that, never recognized as such. And I thought it was very important to, to honor him and to honor all the, the Boy Scouts who did, you know, this tremendous um, task and, and, and managed to save so many children. Okay, so that leads me to, the, to my third question, that how much is it fiction and how much is it based on true events? You just told that you, you heard from a close relative that the things are really was the way uh, we saw it, but something that you had to edit. I'm, I'm as a director. Sometimes I find a story and it's as deep and it's uh, interesting. Don't have enough drama in it, so I sometimes you know have to put in a little bit. Well, th this one definitely had drama. You know, drama was not what was lacking. Um, I, I think the the biggest challenge with a story like this is to. To, to in two hours combine a story that happened, you know, within six, seven years. And, um, and there's also the challenge of, you know, you're hearing the story from a person who's 106 and, and lived this event 70 years ago. So it, it's always important to, you know, like discern what is um, most likely accurate. And then you hear other testimonies and, and at the end of the day, and this is not the first historical film I make, you know, what you do is, is try to be truthful to, to the story, to the characters, and try to be as close as possible to what happened, and then create a narrative that is coherent for the audience to follow within, within two hours. 
and and you know combine episodes you know some things like when he saves his brother didn't happen in the middle of a massive square but you decide to set it there because it's also more exciting um i was i was not able to confirm if the meeting in person between marceau and klaus barbie happened but you know marceau was escaping from barbie and barbie was chasing jewish children and it could have happened and i felt it was very important for the villain and the hero to meet face to face in the film um those are the kind of you know creative licenses i took you know that i couldn't completely confirm but were obviously true to to the original story i think one of the strongest scene when uh, barbie comes on the train and they you have you have the girl uh, in the toilet and they you know have this conversation uh i was really you know watching like uh, you watching a horror movie like <laughs> yeah you want to see it but you don't want to see it yeah no i it's okay. it, i i it's probably one of my favorite scenes too and it's the scene everybody asked me about and it was it was it, it was born out of collaboration with the actors you know it, it, we were rehearsing that was the last scene i wrote we were already in pre-production already in rehearsals and and with Jesse and and Matias who who played um uh, Barbie and and suddenly got the feeling that he was letting them go too easily and instead of going to the typical you know roughing him up and Marcel is able to resist the roughing up of a Nazi I I started thinking what could he ask him that it could be more strategic and could you know really create the mirror image of these two characters and that scene came up and then you know when what we what they did on set was mind blowing for all of us you know i i, I remember shooting Jesse first and all of us being amazed by what he did and then we shot Matias and Jesse asked me can i shoot my part again because he was incredible you know so must do good i want to do yeah, it yeah you know cuz he's like he's going to steal the scene you know and 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 it was and 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 we did and i told jesse you stole the scene too that's the whole point you know that both sides are incredible and they were and and of course clemans in in the in the toilet is you know incredibly powerful so everything combined well and and that scene you know became what it is you know it probably the most stands in the whole film the rest is history as we say in uh, <laughs> polish uh okay you said that uh, this is not your first uh, uh historical movie you 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 shot a biography before uh and this led me to my my to my next question is that your heroes are are really not usual heroes i mean uh marcel marceau at the beginning is really annoying young man uh I think we could say in Hebrew a nudnik someone you know is you're not really want to be friend with uh, and 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 he have to make a long way to become a hero and fulfill his destiny um so it's not it's not every hero that have to make this uh journey but uh you seem to choose those kind of uh, unexpected heroes uh, to write about is it correct or is just coincidence it, i mean i never thought about it but you were probably right you know when i when i think about it i what i found fascinating about marcel is is that this this story is a is the story of an artist who is completely immersed in his own art and completely in love with himself and who thinks that the war is happening to him and it's stopping him from becoming the artist he's meant to become and the person he's meant to become only to later realize that these events are the ones that are going to shape him to become the artist he's meant to be and 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 with with, with, with to achieve the art that is going to make him conquer the world you know and and I found that very deep and and personal because I I have experienced and seen other people experience that in life, you know, sometimes you think the barriers are stopping you 
from getting somewhere, but the barriers are getting you to the actual place that you need to go without you thinking that's the place you need to go. And and I I find that very very universal, you know, because it, it's it's so easy to get drowned by the obstacles and and, but sometimes the obstacles are just traffic signals, you know, it's like, go there, go there, go there. And then you get to a place and you're like, oh, this is why all this stuff happens, you know, but it fails every time because then you start a new journey and you're again frustrated and you don't remember that what happened before was what led you. And and I, I just think it's very rare to see that in a film, you know, usually a film shows you how a perfect person achieves impossible goals. This guy is not a perfect person. He he is his own monster, but he rises to the occasion, takes responsibility, and save others, and that makes him who he was always meant to be. And I just wanted to add that uh, from where I see it, it seems that a little bit, and as every director, you talk about also yourself, uh, about barriers that leads you to a way that you have to find uh, new rooms, new houses, new countries, uh, and, and sometimes you force, but then it shows you the way to uh, to your destiny. I mean, it's a little bit what happened also with you, I think, it's the way I see it. Yeah, I mean, I, I would never compare myself to anybody who survived World War II, you know? I, okay. it, it's, it's very important that we are humble in that sense, but... Um, I mean, he, 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 it happens all the time, you know, you, you would never imagine that you would shoot this movie in Germany, for example, you know, the first stop was France. We always thought we would have to shoot it in France. This is such a French story. But then, you know, the Germans who I least expected were going to support this film went crazy for this film. Um, Warner Brothers Germany immediately came on board. The Bavarian authorities gave us an incredible amount of incentives to shoot it, shoot it there. And I ended up, you know, telling a story that is so close to the horrors of my family, surrounded by Germans and with a German crew and in Nuremberg, in, in Munich, I was living a few blocks away from Hitler's apartment in Munich, you know, and, and it, it all became so personal and so close to the story of my grandparents and where they did it, that it took on a completely different meaning. And we ended up shooting the pantomime at the end of the movie at the Congress Hall in Nuremberg, which is the, where the Nazi rallying grounds uh, were. And that was a coliseum that Hitler was building for himself. Um, and it, you have this Jewish actor um, doing a pantomime of a Jewish mime in front of the troops of Patton, surrounded by a German crew, some of whom are grandkids of Nazis, you know? So it, it did feel like a creative vengeance against the Nazis. and. I would never change that for shooting in France, you know, and 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 it, it, that's the kind of thing that sometimes you you realize a challenge is is an is an opportunity, you know, and and I I do I do feel that a lot of that has happened in in my life for sure, you know, I I left Venezuela when nobody wanted to leave Venezuela, you know, and now everybody wants to leave Venezuela and I made a career in the process, you know, so it's uh, it's definitely personal and it always is. But um, but of course, I, I haven't saved children in the war or anything like that. So I would never dare compare myself to them. OK, so I have a quote from my favorite uh, director from Venezuela, and it goes like this. I think that 90% of the movies that are made are too long and too slow. Did you say that? <laughs> I probably said that when I was 27 years old after I made Sequestro Express. And it may, I, I probably wouldn't say something as definitive as that. <laughs> no, okay. It's, it's okay. And, and, I, and I just wanted to add that uh, maybe this is why this movie is, uh, yes, as you said, it's a biographical and it's a historical movie, but it's, 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 it's really unusual in the sense of, uh, of that it's full of action intensity. And, and what, 
what genre you would say this movie is if you have to define it's tough because it's in a way it's a, it's a thriller you know it's a historical thriller and but it's also the a war movie with a mime as the hero you know so it's the most unlikely war hero ever imaginable um i i i do feel comfortable combining genres and there's humor and there's hope but there's comedy and there's, there's drama and there's horror and there's tension and action um i i it's one of the things that made me fall in love with the story that it was so grand in scope and it can be you know an adventure in itself and and we purposely shot it um in a way that it's not typical for world war ii movies that are usually depressive and and without many colors we always intended to show the world of marceau through his eyes the world of an artist and that's why everything is so aesthetic and and so beautiful in itself because i in 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 a way i'm inviting the audience to see it the world war ii through the eyes of marcel marceau Okay, so my last question, and then we move to uh, the Q&A, because we have uh, many questions from the audience, is, um, well, trying to put it, uh, to make a short one, it's really hard for me, and it's, it's hard for any Jew, but anyway, uh, your storytelling, uh, if there is such a thing, uh, it really has a Jewish, Jewish way or Jewish roots. And I mean that all, all the small details we hear about uh, the heroes, uh, the girls and the boys, are most of the uh, producers that I know would say, oh, cut them out. Or it's, it's not important scenes. It's, uh, you don't have to see the girls uh, uh, getting kissed first period. Uh, just leave it. It's five minutes or four minutes and, then, and, and, and so on and on. But as for me, and I hope not just as a Jew, but as any uh, art or movie loving uh, audience, is really the most important scenes. Really, it's not always the, the scenes with full of actions, uh, but still very important. Uh, do you find this, I mean, you're the writer. Do you, do you find, um, when you write it, it, what do you feel that it's, it's important we have to show all the little details we have to talk about really the characters, how they were created or how they feel at any, any different moments or, uh, or are you struggling with yourself and you say, no, action, action, we need, we need to have action on the screen. Well, it's hard to say. I mean, I usually try to find a balance um, in, in show you what, what I feel is extremely necessary for, for you to understand about each character and, and you know i i i don't usually um approach it like you know you have to know every detail i i feel like what is the least you can know about this character in order for you to care and then sometimes that is a lot you know and, and especially in a movie like this where there are so many characters there's marcel the brother the father the girl um, there is, you know, George and the two sisters. I mean, there, there's Barbie and his wife. I mean, there's a lot of characters to develop in two hours. So, you you know, I really try to condense as much as possible, but I also think it's important to to really invite you to put your, yourself in their shoes. And, and the scene you, you mentioned about the girl um, having her period for the first time, I think is extremely human because at the end of the day, life continues in a war. You don't decide, you know, just because you're in a war, you're not going to go through the emotions of, you know, be, being alive. And and I, I think that is the easiest way to put yourself in the shoes of a character is, is to show them doing the most mundane things in the middle of an extraordinary situation. All right, uh, before we go to the Q&A, let me just thank you the best way I can, Lechaim. It was really, really, really the best movie um, I don't know, in the last few months I saw. Thank you, thank you so much. I don't have wine because it's a little early here. <laughs> you should. I, I said Lechaim to all of you. 